Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we discussed a little bit of the differences between the shoulder joint and the shoulder girdle, the kind of movements they produce, and we started to get into some of the shoulder girdle movements, such as scapular protraction, which was the movement of the scapula actually away from the midline of the body. This was accompanied mainly by shoulder flexion, which is where the arms come in front of the body generally or in the direction in front of the body, such as a bench press. And then we talked about scapular retraction. This is the opposite movement where the scapula actually retract or go toward the midline of the body. So they move more medially. And this is generally accompanied by shoulder extensions, such as in a barbell row, where you're pulling your humerus on either side uh, towards the back of your body or in the direction behind the frontal plane. Okay? So the key there was that every single shoulder joint movement has to be accompanied by a shoulder girdle movement. Okay? Um, there are two shoulder girdle movements, however, that you can do for the most part independently of a shoulder joint movement. Okay? And those are actually uh, scapular elevation and scapular depression. So we're actually going to talk about those right now. First, we're going to talk about scapular elevation, and we're going to do this using kind of the same image that we've been using in the previous uh, video. So we see the scapula right here, kind of corresponds to the scapula down here. And what we see is that for scapular elevation, this is going to involve gliding of the scapula on either side upwards. Now, this is a movement that you can do independently of a shoulder joint movement. You don't have to be moving your humerus to do this. The way you would do this is if you were just holding two dumbbells, in, one in each hand, and you just shrug your shoulders up. You can do the same thing with a barbell. You're not actually moving your shoulder joint at all. You're not moving your humerus. You're just elevating your scapula upward. So how does that work? Well, there's three muscles that are going to be at play here, and some of which are more important than others. Arguably, the most important are the upper fibers of the trapezius. When most think, people think about the trapezius or the traps, they're really thinking about the upper fibers, because these tend to be the ones that you can actually see, um, kind of what gives people kind of a big neck, so to speak. The trapezius are going to be the major agonist of this. And what we see is that the upper fibers, you can't really see it too much because the uh, lower parts of the trapezius are covering up the scapula. But the upper parts of the trapezius are actually going to originate on the occipital bone up here on the skull and then insert on the superior part of the, of the scapula. And so they're going to pull the insertion up toward the origin. And so they're going to elevate the scapula upwards. Okay. So the upper fibers of the trapezius are going to be the major players here. There's also some other muscles that are going to play some minor roles, some more than others. Another important one is the levator scapulae. Here's the levator scapulae, which also had a very, very minor role in scapular retraction. Its major role is going to be in scapular elevation. And that's because even though this muscle is going to run at an angle, we see that most of it is actually going to be in the upwards or vertical direction. And so for the levator scapulae, this is actually going to originate on the transverse process of the first four cervical vertebrae. So it's actually, you can't really see those vertebrae too well, but they're at the very top here, right at the base of the occipital bone. Okay, And then it's going to insert on the upper vertebral border of the scapula. So basically just kind of this up top corner of the scapula. And so when it contracts, it's going to pull mostly upwards. It'll have some action to pull toward the midline, so in retraction, but it's mostly going to be upwards. Now, even though it's mostly upwards, it's not as important as the trapezius. The trapezius upper fibers are largely responsible for elevation, but the levator scapulae does have an important role as well, just not as important. The most minor are going to be the rhomboids. Now, the rhomboids we can see uh, are going to be involved mainly in retraction because of how they attach on the scapula. But notice they also run at an angle. Their angle, however, is mostly horizontal, which is why they're mainly involved in retraction. But there is a small fraction of this that's actually vertical because they run at an angle. So the rhomboids can play some role in the elevation, but not a lot. So when you do shrugs and you are elevating your scapula against a resistance, 
you're mainly working the trapezius and then also the levator scapulae. If you really wanted to work the rhomboids, you really should do something like rows, something that's actually gonna force scapular retraction, okay? This muscle right here is the right trapezius. As you can see, it's a superficial muscle and it's a very large muscle. Now, as we mentioned, the trapezius, any fiber on it or any region is gonna originate somewhere on the spine, on the vertebra. Some of them are going to be near the occipital bone of the skull, whereas other origins are going to be near the bottom of the thoracic vertebra. But all of the fibers are going to insert on the scapula. But what you see is that each of these fibers runs in a slightly different direction. If you have fibers that originate towards the skull, towards the occipital bone, the fibers are going to run like this. And so when they pull the scapula toward the origin, they're going to be pulling mostly in an upward direction, which is why the upper fibers of the trapezius are going to be involved in scapular elevation. This muscle over here, or these two, are the rhomboids. The one on top is the smaller one. This is the rhomboid minor. The one on the bottom, the inferior muscle, is the rhomboid major, and we see that it's also larger. Both of these muscles, notice, run obliquely. So they're still going to originate on the vertebra of the spine, but they sort of run in a downwards, but also lateral direction toward the scapula. Now, obviously the rhomboid minor, as you can see here, because it's superior, it's gonna insert on a more superior aspect of the scapular spine, whereas the rhomboid major is gonna insert on the more inferior part of the scapula. But in any case, because they run obliquely or at an angle, they're going to have motions in two directions. Most of that motion is going to be pulling the scapula toward the midline. So both of these muscles mainly facilitate scapular retraction or scapular adduction. But because there's a component of the force that's going to be moving upwards, there's a slight amount of scapular elevation that the rhomboids are involved in. Although because you can see that it's mostly horizontal, most of the movement produced by the rhomboids, major and minor, is going to be scapular retraction. This muscle right here at the top is the levator scapulae. And what you can see here is that it originates on different cervical vertebrae up here very near the base of the skull at the occipital bone and it's going to insert on the top aspect here of the scapula. Now the levator scapulae does run slightly at an angle, but the vast majority of the muscle is oriented in the vertical direction, which is why when the levator scapulae pulls the insertion point right here on the scapula towards its origins, it's mostly pulling upward, which is why the levator scapulae is involved in scapular elevation. However, if we look mostly at the parts of the muscles, the heads toward the origins, there's a slight amount of horizontal force. And so for that reason, the levator scapulae is going to be involved in a very slight amount of scapular retraction, which would move the scapula toward the midline. But in any case, as I mentioned, scapular elevation is one of those movements of the scapula that can be done independently of a shoulder joint movement. You don't actually have to move the humerus in order to move the scapula upwards. Case in point, we have a barbell shrug. You can do this with dumbbells or in this case a barbell. You notice that from resting position right here on the left to when he shrugs his shoulders upward, his humerus is not moving. The only thing that's happening is the scapula is being pulled upward, uh, but that's accomplished through his trapezius, upper fibers, and then also the levator scapulae with very minor contributions from the rhomboids, both major and minor, all right? The antagonistic or opposite movement of elevation is scapular depression. Now, scapular depression is kind of hard to explain to do. It's not something that most people actually work that much because it has a much lower range of motion than elevation. Most people who go to the gym and work all the body parts are gonna be working the trapezius, the traps, by doing something to the effect of shrugs. Depression is not something that most people are gonna be working that much because it has a much lower range of motion. Scapular depression is most easily done on a dip station. So if you're already supporting your body weight on the dip station, if you forcibly move your body upwards relative to your arms, you're not bending your elbows. All you're doing is you're forcibly moving your body torso 
upwards relative to your arms, that's actually going to force the scapula to depress or move downwards. Um, again, it's not something that most people do, but it's actually, you get a little bit of extra motion on the dip machine or station if you actually do this. And you're actually going to be working uh, two muscles in particular. One is going to be the trapezius, and the other is going to be the pectoralis minor. And specifically with the trapezius, we now have the lower fibers. The lower fibers are going to or originate on the thoracic vertebrae, and they're actually going to attach to the scapula from the bottom. And so when they pull the insertion, which is on the scapula, toward these thoracic vertebrae, they're actually pulling the scapula downwards. Okay. In terms of the pectoralis minor, these are still going to originate on the surface of the ribs three through five, which we saw in the previous video. And they're still going to attach to the coracoid process of the scapula. But the way that the pectoralis minor inserts on the scapula, it's at an angle, which you can't really see too well in this image. But it suffices to say that when it pulls on the scapula, part of that movement is actually going to be downwards. Most of the movement is actually laterally or in terms of scapular protraction, but there's a small fraction of it that actually pulls the scapula downwards. But overall in depression, the major muscle is going to be the lower fibers of the trapezius. That's the major agonist of this movement. If we look at the lower fibers of the trapezius, they originate on the very bottom parts of the thoracic vertebra or the lower thoracic vertebra and still insert on the scapula. So when they pull the insertion point toward their origin, they're pulling in a more downwards direction. And so this is why the lower fibers of the trapezius produce scapular depression because they're lowering the scapula downward. Okay. And again, this is a really difficult move to conceptualize because it's not something we normally do on a regular basis. Shrugging your shoulders is relatively easy and it has a, a much higher range of motion. Elevation does. Depression you really don't do much of. But if you get on a dip station and you elevate yourself upwards and then you forcibly move your torso up relative to your arms, so you're not bending your arms, you'll actually force a little bit of scapular depression. And you'll notice if you do this that it certainly does have a much lower range of motion. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a good um, understanding of how scapular elevation and depression work, which muscles are involved and so forth, and also of the differences between the two. And just remember that really for the movements of the scapula, yes, some of them like elevation and depression can occur independently of the shoulder joint, but anytime you have a shoulder joint movement, whether it's shoulder flexion, extension, abduction, or adduction, you have to have a corresponding movement of the scapula. And I didn't really focus much on upward rotation and downward rotation because we'll come back to these two movements when we actually talk about shoulder joint abduction and adduction because they tend to go hand in hand with those. All right? So we will come back to these two. But in the next video, we're going to talk mainly about shoulder joints. We're going to talk about shoulder abduction and adduction. And that's where we'll come back to these. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.